most typical projects will have, among other things, a splash screen, a main menu, and you may not be able to read this on my screen because it's a little bit small, uh, and they will have an options screen. So uh, splash, main menu, play GUI, and an options screen. Um, so if you look under the interfaces folder under five frame, let me bring up the frame first so you can see what I'm talking about. Better to show and then talk. So I'm going to run this, and what's going to happen is it's going to launch the splash screen, which is nothing special. It's just a simple uh, texture with some a word on it to show you what scene it is. And I'm going to let it run through. It takes two seconds, and then it's going to go over to the main menu. Now, I set up the splash screen example so that if you wanted to, you could allow users to click it to bypass it. And Ed, I, before you before you do that, I want to say one one thing just to kind of add to that is that. Uh, with Composer, um, typically it's recommended that you use the Composer template. There's a, a file that's in the, in the documentation that you can um, use as a starting point for your Composer scene. It has mm -hmm. all the um, has all the code in it for all the events and everything that that Ed's going to talk about. But uh, it's one single file, and then you put the, you put your code in according to what you need. Now what Ed, it's it's done here. This is essentially that. Except yeah, what, I have I've put extra organization on top of it. Well, you've gone the you've got I like that you've gone one step further, which is acknowledging the fact that the scenes don't you know you don't have one scene in your app, right? So having right. the having the scene template is good. Having the composer template is good, but uh, you need to be able to wire them together and, and make them function, and that's what this is. This is a a working example of multiple scenes. Um, in a framework that it's already kind of established for you. So. Absolutely. Actually, it's a good thing you brought that up before we started here. One thing I see people do a lot is have the scene definition in main.lua, which is absolutely wrong. You can do it. In theory, you can do it. But it is absolutely wrong. You should not be doing that. You should have... That's the whole point to, to me. The whole point of having a scene management system is that you keep your scenes separate in separate files, maybe even separate folders if they're really complicated. Yeah. So, for example, all of my scenes are very simple. They're one file. The scene contains all the code for the scene. But if I was making, and this ha happens sometimes, if I was making a game that had multiple levels where the levels were somehow different, they were not, they didn't follow a similar recipe. I may, may make subfolders where each folder has a scene file and a bunch of support script files for that particular level or that particular part of the application. And so it's just a way of staying organized. But in, for coming back to this example, this is, this is the fundamental example which has, again, it has the three traditional files, main config and build settings. Everything else is in sub subfolders. So we got an image folder for whatever images are in our application or game. We got a scripts folder, and that's where I put any utility scripts that I may be using. And this framework, I forgot to mention, comes with the uh, object-oriented uh, button class that we introduced several shows back. So, And I did that because I just too lazy. I didn't want to write up another button um, class just for this framework, and it worked well. Most people only use toggle and push buttons, and this one supports both, so we're good to go out of the box. And then again, IFC, which is the interfaces or the scenes. So I'm going to run this now. It's going to go to the splash screen, and in two seconds, transition to the main menu. Then if I click on play from the main menu, that'll slide in the play GUI, and this is where my game content would be or my application content would be. The back button merely transition, transitions back to the main menu. And then I gave one more example, which was an options overlay. <clears throat> so in Composer, there's two kinds of scenes. There's a traditional scene, which is a scene that owns the screen completely. It's the only scene that is present. And then there's an overlay, which is a scene that is loaded on top of a current scene. And at this point, 
you can make a choice. The overlay can allow touches to go through that scene and, and fall onto the scene below it, or you can block that. And most people block it. It's what's called... Um, uh, what was it? It's, uh, it comes from the concept of dialogues, and I can't remember it. Of course, this happens. To me. Mo modal. Okay. Modal. People, yes, it's modal. Exactly. All right. It's right. It's right in the. It's right in the flag definition. It's a modal, in a sense, dialogue, but the dialogue itself covers the entire screen. And the purpose of this is to allow you most mostly when I do it in my games, when I work with clients and for myself is really you won't see a full screen image slide in like I just did. What it'll be is like a little dialog box and some content and some buttons for them to push. But even if they click somewhere else on the screen, like I'm clicking on the options button right now, but this is a modal overlay. And so it says, no, the touches are not allowed to fall through to the scene underneath this. So uh, again, we have scenes and we have overlays. And the overlay's primary purpose is to give us a nice way to slide in some content or make some content appear over an existing ongoing screen or scene without unloading that scene. So that scene could continue to be active. Things could, are going on in the background, but we can't access them temporarily. I, I, and I also want to throw in, uh, just to kind of make the connection in case people haven't done it, is that you can... Uh, modify the types of transitions. So earlier you showed us the sampler for the different types of transitions and speeds. Um, and with this framework, you have provided us some default options uh, of how those transitions might occur, but you can modify that to use any one of those transitions that was in the sampler. So if you don't want it to slide up from the top or the bottom, then you can, you can change that. Absolutely. I'll show you the places in the code where these transitions are set up. And then I would suggest people use the sampler to find the transitions they like and simply use the code that they see there and replace it here. Use the settings that they see on the sampler. So we'll go back to it real fast. Actually, uh, let's look at one and uh, just show people the example here. So the splash screen, when, when we run it, I click now, it'll slide um, from right to left. So the main menu slides in from the right. And so let me go look at the splash screen code. So the transition that I used there was slide left with a time of 500 milliseconds. So I could, let's say I just didn't like that. I can go back to the sampler, the transition sampler, and let's say, um, let's say I like zoom in and out with uh, one, let's say, uh, 1,000 millisecond timing. So zoom in and out. And that seems right. So then I would just go over here. I'm going to make sure I'm typing it right. Okay, it, is, it is case sensitive. It is in fact case sensitive. And mm -hmm. let's go 1000. Let's go back to the framework. Click the screen. And now we get the new transition. Boom. We got to try it out in the sampler refine it over there, put it in our app. 